not Eric Torn, but I'm Jonathan Bates. I'm a co-author there in our book, Paradise Lost. Not Paradise Lost. Paradise Lost. If you are interested in, if it's legal for me to sell them, if you're interested in buying a copy, you have them. And then I also have flyers for my business. If you're interested in that, let me go ahead and get started. Um, lights. So this picture here um, is of our two families. That's Eric with his son kneeling down. His wife, Monica Claire, me and my wife, Megan's son, Jesse. Uh, I, I wish I would, could have been here all the days of the, of the conference, but uh, I was with Jesse, um, sticking to him like glue up until about an hour ago. So um, we share uh, this landscape together. Um, most people know, some people here might know about our story, um, the general Paradise Lot, Holy Edible Forest Garden story. Today I'm going to focus particularly on uh, not the permaculture aspect of what we're doing, uh, Albert already pretty much covered that, but a particular piece within that, which is our, our, uh, our bio shelter. Um, and here's a little bit of the design just to give you an idea of kind of the scope of which our design process, permaculture design process took us over the last 10 years. But you can see that little plastic hoop back there that's the first iteration of our greenhouse, and I'll talk briefly about the second iteration, which includes our uh, what I'll be talking more about today, which is our aquaponic system, which is has an element of biochar in it. So just to give you an overview of, of the focus of the focus, um, this is uh, our second generation greenhouse, which is a passive solar greenhouse. Uh, it's insulate, uh, super insulated on the north and east and west wall with the uh, south facing collecting the sun it's powered just by the sun it has lots of elements of ecology including fish clams black soldier fly larva 800 gallons of water subtropical plants solar panels that power it power it all uh, um, and we're able to turn that 400 square feet of land from uh, zone six um, climate to um, central florida last year was negative seven degrees outside and it was 29 degrees inside. So what that allows us to do with a, a simple solar plant panel and some really good design and planning is allow us to grow uh, things like, let me get my fancy wand out, from my dad, Ralph Bates. Um, this right here is a hardy uh, um, avocado. So we, we've overwintered hardy, uh, hardy avocado outside with protection in Massachusetts. We're very proud about that. We'll see if it's, we're able to do it again. Uh, but some of the things we were able to do here and experiment with over the last year uh, was a result of our aquaponic system. The 800 gallons of water is a, not only an amazing diverse ecosystem, but it also allows us to heat the, um, provide heat for the bio, um, the bio shelter. Um, and so it's not only our, our heat battery, but one of our heat batteries, but it's also a very diverse ecosystem. So here's just a very quick, if you've never seen, um, a diagram of what aquaponics is. It's essentially a merging of the ideas of aquaculture and hydroponics into one technique. Um, it's fairly new, although I'll get to it in a minute. These techniques have been used for thousands of years, but in terms of uh, kind of our kind of techie, westernized world, it's, it's a fairly a newer technology where you have the plants growing in the media, that, uh, that drain into a fish tank, or filter, drain into a fish tank, the fish poop is taken back up, filtered by the plants again, and back down. It's a little bit more complex than that, but that's the general gist of it. And I just wanted to mention, in terms of um, the scale of these systems, they're anywhere from large uh, systems that can be industrial in scale to small, like mine, which is only 800 gallons. Uh, they could be low diversity uh, systems where it's just plants and fish and water to very high diversity, which I think we're getting to that point in our system where we have clams and crayfish and uh, lots of other things growing in there, plankton that are reproducing, fish are reproducing. Um, it could be a hobby, which I'm kind of more in the hobby direction to more much larger industrial scale. Australia is starting to kind of ramp it up a little bit and even some places in the United States. Uh, and then it could be any, anywhere from temperate art example to full tropical systems. So a little bit about uh, this merging of biochar and aquaponics. The first set of um, pictures up there I, I recently uh, ran into, which is really quite astounding and, and mind-blowing to me. Um, 
uh, in the in Bolivian, uh, Bolivian Amazon, there's uh, as many or more than 2,000 square miles uh, at, around Lake Titicaca that are they're essentially dug out trenches and, and, and pools and ponds um, that you know 2,000 years ago were, were filled and drained in, in some complex system by the indigenous people. Um, and what I read recently in a book, um, uh, biochar, James Drugs, the biochar debate. There's a one, two sentence mention of this. He says that, that, that they believe that the factories found biochars in the hills that they, when they dug the trenches, they hilled up the, the, the mounds and in the mounds with biochar. So this is, this, these techniques using aquatic systems have been going on for thousands of years. So that's kind of, kind of way back example. A uh, more recent example in Japan, uh, super stone clean biochar. They're doing some inter interesting things where they're actually producing food materials at much higher sped up rates than uh, typical. Here's two examples, uh, clam, uh, the, the yellow clams, which we, ac we actually are al also working with. Uh, there they are right there. Um, it's fairly simple to grow them in, in closed systems for protein and shrimp. They're getting much higher rates of production and size using feeding them biochar and also growing them in like uh, rice patties where biochar has been integrated into the, the subsoil or the so topsoil. Um, one local example other than me that I found out recently is this Farm Fresh project, which is only a couple years old. They're doing some aquaponics where they're integrating biochar into their systems. I don't know a lot about them, but I want to know more. Um, they're on the small scale. And then I recently read about this Bioponica folks in Atlanta, Georgia, and he's one of the only other ones I've read about who's integrating biochar into their systems. Now, I'm very new to this, so if anyone else wants to push information about biochar and aquaponics my way, I'd love to, to read more about it, but it was actually fairly difficult to find a lot of information about it. Um, Nesvi uh, produced, produced and is producing biochar um, for agricultural purposes. Uh, I had an idea when I was doing my aquaponic system last year, what if we just threw in some biochar for fun, if I could get some for cheap and just experiment with it. Uh, I have a connection um, at Nesvi and Eric, through Eric and my other history with them and they were like, dude, Sure, we'll give you some, try it out, and then just make sure you educate the public about it. So that's why I'm here, one of the reasons. Um, uh, this is in the coarse form, so it's actually at, at first hard to get it because they're grinding it up and there's not a lot of this larger, larger pieces that we need to use more like a gravel. So um, biochar as a media, uh, what I really find fascinating about it and where it has a lot of potential is that it is uh, homegrown, that is you can grow the stuff that you burn and then you create the stuff right on site. It's, uh, it could be locally purchased, so a, a manufacturer could purchase it in your town and you could buy it from them. It's locally and renewably derived. Um, it's biochemically dynamic, which all of you probably know. Uh, it's especially in water, it can also be the same. It's very lightweight. I'll pass these around. Here's uh, a bag of the expanded shale, which is becoming very popular as a media in in uh, aquaponics. Yes. <laughs> uh, and then biochar. It's a very similar weight. It's also known as permatil. <laughs> permatil. Okay. Um, it's this 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 coarser material was hard to find, which is also a challenge for this material, but. It's, uh, it's also a new product, a new byproduct of, of creating biochar uh, or a product that you could just create. Um, it's ecological, not ecological. That is, we're thinking about biochar as a media that is, is very diverse in it, the systems that it can have an impact on, um, in its creation, in its use, and in its um, recycling. Whereas the, the shale is mined, I think one place is in New York, it's shipped, Packaged, sold, and it's a rock. So there's not a lot of it. Just it's just one entity. There's not a lot of use or reuse of it, and it's expensive to mine. And you actually have to. I think they have to expand it with energy to get it to be porous. That's the one. So yeah. so that that material is to me is, is going forward. If you're doing aquaponics, is is a step in the right direction because it's more regional, but it's not the end all be all. 
Benefits, you know, of course, with making biochar ideas is waste reduction, energy co-production, climate change mitigation. Some of the challenges in aquaponics, um, the cost of production always, uh, price and profitability tied to energy and carbon industry, um, and the fact that this particular course material is not really available as far as I can tell. So the experiment gave you a, a broad brush overview of all the history and the experience that I have. Um, I took a 55 gallon drum, I cut it in half, plastic drum, connected it up with some simple plumbing and pumps, and this is a fill drain system, so every uh, hour for 15 minutes this fills with water, uh, and then has, it cuts off after 15 minutes and drains. Essentially what that's doing is it's pulsing nutrient fish water into the roots, root zone of the plants. The plants can then utilize that with the microorganisms that are also there and produce whatever you're producing, food, uh, biomaterial, um, fruit. So I did, I cut it in half and just separated exact amounts of the shale and exact amounts of the biochar, of course biochar. So here's a, here's a the side by side, um, going the wrong way. Uh, here's the before shot, this is July of this year. When it started going, there's basil, tomatoes, uh, pineapple sage, um, canna, uh, water chestnuts is the little grassy thing. <coughs> Basil, canna, tomato. That's just two months wow. later. Um, and what I like most actually about this picture is the uh, shale and the biochar are exactly identical. I haven't, didn't do enough research to know whether the biochar was better or worse. But at least it's identical so far. After really six months of running, this was just, it, it, I happened to take the pictures at these times. Um, so I think that's a pretty interesting experiment. Um, and we're getting, we're getting some food, although we didn't really do it necessarily this run to produce a lot of food. We just wanted to have the diversity and so show that it worked. So some conclusions. Probably ending my time here. You're fine. Okay. So it seems like it, it's inert. You know, when you put something that used to be uh, uh, a tree into the water, one of the fears you have is is it going to rot? Because wood does that really well in water. Um, or is it going to have some kind of effect on the water because it's um, a bio, you know, it's a bi biological in form, but because it's biochar, it's fairly inert, as far as I can tell. You're welcome to open a bag and feel it. It's not degrading at all in your hand. There is dust that it didn't wash completely off, but that's not something different. Um, it's highly effective in it acting as a media. Um, it stays in solid form. Um, it's safe for fish and plants, as far as I can tell. There's no uh, negative impacts. Uh, the Japanese group doing their biochar, they're, act, they're actually fi finding if you feed it directly to the animals, it's actually a multiple effect where you're actually increasing health and vitality and size. So I'm assuming that, that the, there's a potential for that if you, I keep using it, the things will grow better. Uh, it's lighter weight than shale, of course, and the, the price is comparable. I just did a quick eBay look of all the different materials and found on average shale is about $25 for a 50 pound bag. Clay, which is a very common media used in aquaponics, clay pellets, uh, they're also manufactured in a kiln. It's uh, $70 per 50 pounds. That's all. If you're doing thousands of gallons of this kind of system, 50 pound bags become very expensive, both on their own and to ship them. Um, and the, and it, most of those clay pellets now are being, most of them are being manufactured in Europe. So you're, you're shipping them across the pond um, there is a new material in California being created. It's made out of blown glass. That's another conversation. Um, and then biochar is, is rel re relatively uh, similar to the clay cost, about $60 for the 50 pound bag. Um, so again, it's, it's this coarse material, which is a half to three quarters inch, uh, is the best size for aquaponics of the media. Um, it seems like, I mean, how many, how many people are using size biochar at that size. I don't think it's very common. It's usually ground up in a powder. So I'm that, selling it. You're selling it. Okay, <laughs> hey, I, I, should, I should talk to you. Um, uh, and so that's a challenge. And then um, I also noticed when I was 
cleaning it and working with it that 15% of it floats. So if you're buying it at $60 for a 50 pound bag and 50% of it floats, it becomes more expensive and it's hard to work with. <coughs> Next steps, I'm suggesting there's probably way more than this, um, but we it'd be great to have more exper experimental trials that are actually being published and given to the public, because right now it's more of what people like me or people like the folks in Japan who aren't internationally um, advertising as much. Um, longer duration trials, you know, one season, growing season isn't enough. Um, and then the, uh, if my assumptions are true, there's no need to do much else. Because I I pretty much, I'm, I'm convinced that from historical records, from what people are already doing and from what I found, this is a huge opportunity. Um, again, there's my info. Uh, one thing, if people are really interested in this idea of aquaponics, if you haven't read or heard about it yet, this is a new book. Uh, by Silvio Bernstein, Aquaponic Gardening. It's pretty much one of the best step-by-step -step guide to raising vegetables and fish together. One of the best um, books right now out uh, for these techniques. Um, and it has everything but biochar in it. It's interesting. We should... Right. <laughs> uh, the, next, the next version, if we, if we can all call her tonight when we get home, uh, say, hey, Sylvia. You know about biochar? If you don't, I think she does. But if you don't, let's get in your next next edition. So there's me. Thank you. <laughs>